Welcome to episode 177 of Reclaiming the Faith. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen. Today, we're going to be talking about wolves and false prophets in the church. You can find links to all of my resources at philsbaker.com. And if you're blessed by this episode, please consider leaving a positive review on our Apple podcast channel, Reclaiming the Faith. You can check out my catalog of podcasts for my show, The Faithful Podcast with Stephanie Baker. Also, I've got a new book, The Final Abominable Temple, which you can purchase in audio, digital, hardback, and paperback formats on Amazon. And if you've read it, please consider leaving a review there too. And also please go to our Spotify channel, Reclaiming the Faith, and leave a rating and review there as well. And finally, we are blessed to be a part of Omega Frequency. And you can find links to all of our content there at omegafrequency.com. All right, let's get into episode 177. So, going to be hitting on a uh, weighty topic today. Mm Mm-hmm. Wolves and false prophets and false teachers in the church. Right. And this kind of came to my mind because of the recent Mike Bickle stuff at IHOP. Mm -hmm. Uh, If you haven't been following along with that, I'd encourage folks to go check out the uh, Wake Up and Win podcast. That can really help you out. Uh, That's with Blaze and Christina Foray. Um, they're doing a great job over there, but, you know, as we're looking at this, you know, there are people that recognize that Bickle is a false prophet or a wolf, false teacher, but then there are others that have been at the church for a really long time who don't think he's those things, Mm -hmm. you know, um, we were at a church together with a, uh, a pastor and an executive pastor that did a bunch of shady things. Mm -hmm. So like, how would we define them? How would the Bible define those kind of people? Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, in this term, like wolf gets and false prophet, false teacher, that gets used quite a bit though about people who are not engaging in the type of alleged like sins that Mike Bickle has committed. Uh, maybe because they're teaching a certain doctrine that folks don't agree with, that maybe isn't uh, against anything in like basic Nicene Creed or Apostles' Creed statements, but um, maybe uh, it's uh, Armenian or Calvinistic. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you, you have these terms get thrown around like that. So, I, it's weird. It's like these terms sometimes, it seems, um, get thrown around when they maybe shouldn't. Right. And then sometimes they're not used when they should be used. Mm. You mean like to protect somebody or something? Maybe, maybe. Or uh, maybe all of the hallmarks of a wolf are there or false prophet are there, but people believe the person's a true prophet. Right. You know, so what we wanted to do today is look at what the Bible says about wolves and false prophets and um, false teachers a little bit. We're not going to look at everything that the Bible does, but then we'll also look at what some of the early Christians said about it. And we'll look at a couple or one prominent example of one of these guys named Marcus, which is going to be a wild story. But um, yeah, so let's go ahead and get into it. So um, classic Jesus passage from the Sermon on the Mount talks about wolves and uh, false prophets. So Stephanie, would you mind reading Matthew 7, verse 15 through 20? Yeah. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from bush, thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. 
A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Yeah. Anything standing out to you from that? Yeah, I think you and I were kind of talking about this a little earlier. Um, there, I think that some things that we think are fruits in our, like culturally, things that cause us to think like, oh, God is with this person or God has anointed this person are um, not necessarily fruits at all, whether they're good or bad fruit, but maybe they're just like attributes that we prize that could maybe even be like a little bit of red flags sometimes. But what I mean by that is like the people that get moved to the front, people that get elevated a lot of the time in churches are usually charismatic leaders. They have dynamic personalities. They might be really good speakers. They might be really hip looking. Um, Like a King Saul. Yeah. Or, you know, like a, um, what's the Hillsong guy's name? Carl Lentz. Yeah. Yeah. Like a, you know, very trendy looking person knows how to do. Very good speaker. Yeah. And knows how to do like social media well. Like these are things that are nowhere in the description of a biblical leader, but they've become very much a part of culturally a Christian leader in Western culture, I guess, and probably beyond, but certainly there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when Jesus is talking about being where, beware of false prophets, um, he's probably got Deuteronomy 13 in mind uh, and Deuteronomy 18 in mind. In Deuteronomy 13, uh, the Lord says that like if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or wonder and the sign and wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you saying, let's go after other gods. So let's go commit idolatry. Then you should not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams because the Lord is testing you to know if you're going to love him with all your heart and soul, right? And to fear his commandments. So this is interesting. This is something that the Lord is allowing Mm -hmm. to come in. And it's a person who's claiming to represent Yahweh. So he's in sheep's clothing. Right. And he he does signs and wonders or Mm -hmm. he makes a prophecy. Yeah. And it comes true. So how is this person doing like in one sense, they're, they're true miraculous things. They're, uh, they're evil, Mm -hmm. but they're literally happening. Yeah. Uh, He prophesies, you know, something and it comes true. So, I mean, that could be by chance, I guess, or it could be something that's demonically inspired. And we'll get into that in a little bit uh, with the early Christians. But this person is actually trying to get the people to move away from allegiance to Lot, to Yahweh. Mm-hmm. So that would be a fruit that you see later. So he looks and talks like a prophet of God, but actually this is all a design to move people away from allegiance to the Lord. Yeah. The, the verse makes it sound like this is like super straightforward. Like this is like, he's like, let's go worship the devil together or something. But it's, I don't imagine that that's anything what it looks like. Like it's going to be, if it's testing, I don't think it's going to be super, super obvious like that. We have to like have a relationship with God where we, you know, know his word and we know his voice. And so that we can recognize when things are, you know, off or things are not okay. But yeah, the phrasing makes it sound like it's like, it's going to be blatantly obvious. And sometimes it is, but I think a lot of the times it's more hidden than that. Yeah. One of the more obvious kind of things that a false prophet would do, you would see in Deuteronomy 18, 20, a prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak. Um, That would be like a 
a more hopefully obvious thing for people that really know the word. Mm-hmm. Um, or like he makes a prophecy and it doesn't come true, that kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, but. Or if it's like Christian tarot card reading. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's right out of Bethel, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, really got to know the word. But also like with this fruit idea, know them by their fruits. If you continue that agricultural analogy, um, kind of like sowing and reaping, you're not going to see fruit necessarily right away. Mm-hmm. It may take time Yeah. to see that. And one way to kind of think about it is like if someone's trying to keep up a lie, you might be able to convince people for a little bit. Yeah. But over time, the more you spend, more time you spend with that person, maybe converse with that person, you can start to see holes in mm-hmm. it. But it often will, if a person's a really good liar, yeah. you know, it's, uh, it takes a little bit of time to right. see that. And that may be w- one reason why we should be slow to have, uh, people come and take up leader leadership yeah. positions that we don't know. Yeah. You know. I mean that that makes so much sense and I think it doesn't happen all that often because like we want to, you know, we want to elevate this person quickly, like God's God's anointing them. And I think that among like the early Christians that doesn't seem to be like they didn't stop people from you know, teaching them to be like a disciple and to share the gospel early on, but they weren't necessarily making them a big time overseer or leader in the church immediately. Yeah. So now one of the things that uh, Jesus does in Matthew seven, he says that false prophets are wolves. He says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. So, There, Jesus is showing some overlap. He's saying that basically all false prophets are wolves. But, as we'll see later, not all wolves are false prophets. Right. Think like Venn diagram kind of thing. And a false (laughs) prophet could also be a false teacher, Mm -hmm. but not all false teachers are necessarily false prophets. You know, teaching is a gift of the Holy Spirit, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Prophesying is a gift of the Holy Spirit. So people with that are teachers could prophesy, but they may not be prophets, you could say, right? And people that are prophets may not be like in a role of teaching, but they could, Mm -hmm. right? So you can have overlap with all these and a false teacher could certainly be a wolf, Right, but a uh, wolf doesn't necessarily have to be a prophet or a teacher. Mm-hmm. But some of them get all the titles. Yeah, absolutely. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I wish we had a visual Venn diagram and a whiteboard. <laughs> oh, the uh, limitations of podcasting. <laughs> yeah, so let's look at uh, John ten because this kind of gets into some uh, distinction. Okay, now t- to me. This is uh, John, John 10, verse 11. This says, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Mm-hmm. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd is not the owner of the sheep. He sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees, talking about the hired hand, he flees because he's a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. Now, to me, this is really interesting. So one of the, I guess, uh, distinguishing features of a hired hand is that they don't actually love the sheep they use the sheep to feed themselves. They use the sheep to make money. Mm -hmm. It's a job for them. It's not a love for them. It's not like you could say it's, they don't actually, yeah, they don't, like Jesus says, they don't actually care about the sheep. So when they sense that they're in trouble, 
they oftentimes will mm. try to escape that trouble. Right. Instead of truly protecting the sheep, maybe there's a better way to say it. When trouble comes, they don't protect the sheep, they protect themselves. Right. Yeah, I just had this thought, like, I don't know, we personally know a lot of people that were in formal ministry, full-time ministry that are no longer. And I could see how sometimes like working at a church in a bad experience could turn you into basically a hired hand. Like you did care, but somebody who was a false prophet, false teacher, wolf, basically killed that inside of you or, you know, caused some hurt that made it really hard to care for the sheep. May not have been anything the sheep did, but, you know, I could see how that would happen. But, you know, um, you know, we were talking earlier a little bit about this, but the idea of like self-preservation, um, yeah, it, it does, it makes me think of how like some of these staff members at IHOP are turning their backs on the victims who are coming forward. You know, they're not treating them in a Christ-like way, like not listening to them or making them retell stories in a inappropriate kind of way, or basically they're not looking out for the needs of their their flock and they are supposedly the ones lead, leading them, but they, you know, that's not what they're about. They're they're looking out for protecting the brand or protecting the company. Yeah. So one of the interesting aspects of this dynamic that you're kind of hitting on, uh, a wolf will reveal whether a shepherd is a true shepherd or a hired hand. Mm. So that's a benefit of a wolf yeah. is that you may just have a hired hand in your midst and you think he's a good shepherd, but wolves kind of bring bring it out. Yeah. So that's it's interesting. And that's kind of what it, it seems like what's happening there with uh, a bit a bit of IHOP. Mm-hmm. So um, let's I, uh, go I ahead. I was going to say like this also could look like, and we were kind of talking about this too, but um, this could be like taking the easy road. So that might mean like there's something, there's an accusation of something that might be illegal or immoral. And you're like, oh, okay, this is bad. We want this, you know, leader out of our church, but I'm not gonna, you know, try to look, contact their future employer, let them know about this. I mean, it's just these kind of things are rampant. And it's one of the things that like, evangelical churches and other churches, but specifically people hate on evangelical churches a lot that we protect predators or we protect people that are abusing folks. And so what what would that maybe look like to be a shepherd in that kind of instance? What I mean, do you do you contact the next employer or do you, you know, let them know, hey, this is our concern. We love this person. We've gone to them. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think that's a that's a good thing to do. Yeah. Um, I, the the main the first thing that a good shepherd is going to do when the wolf comes is confront the wolf. Mm-hmm. Now that can look different, yeah. you know. If you're not on staff and you're confronting the wolf, you don't have this threat of being fired, right? But like. In in our situation, when we confronted the leaders, because you know I was on staff, and you know some of our friends were on staff, when we confronted the leadership, we were forced to basically resign, yeah, or lie. So it's lie or resign. Mm-hmm. So you know we resign. Now that looks like leaving the flock when the wolf is there or, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, something dangerous is there for the flock, but we confronted the wolf and that cost us um, salary. You know, Mm -hmm. it it cost, you know, significantly. We got banned from the church. Yeah. (laughs) You know, so we had to leave. Now, we weren't actively going around and warning people. Right. But when people asked us, we told our story. Yeah. 
And um, the people were smart in our case. A lot of them uh, were very smart and also went and confronted. Mm -hmm. And the more that those people talked, the more they kind of revealed what was really going on right? Um, as they tried to protect themselves. So it's hard to know, even in those situations, if, if they were a hired hand, if they're hired hands or if they're wolves. Yeah. It's hard to know sometimes. But um, I don't think we saw false teaching going on, like in terms of bad doctrine a lot, mm-hmm. maybe with one of them, but not the main guy. We didn't see like prophecies happening because our church wasn't really that type of, you know, church. Right. At least that stuff wasn't coming from the pulpit, you know, thus saith the Lord kind of stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. God told me, you know, I have had this dream last night, you know, that wasn't happening at that church. But as we're going to see, like some of the qualities of a false teacher, what makes a false teacher may not necessarily be bad doctrine, but it's actually sinful lifestyle, Mm -hmm. which there was. Yeah. So, I don't know. There's, again, bleed over, man. You know, like, man, I just called you man. There's Sorry. bleed over uh, <laughs> between perhaps, you know, like a hired hand and a uh, wolf or a hired hand and a false teacher, right? Mm-hmm. But let's go more into this wolf stuff. Um, so, this is Acts 20. This is Paul speaking to the elders of Ephesus as he's on his way to Jerusalem. So, Steph, would you read Acts 20, verse 28 through 30? Sure. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. All right. There are a couple of, um, to me, interesting aspects about this text. Um, Number one, you have a plurality of leadership at the church in Ephesus. You have many overseers, many elders. It's not one. Right. It's not a head pastor kind of thing. You have a plurality, which is really important for many reasons. But he then says, Paul then says that after his departure, savage wolves will come in among you. And your Bible said, arise among you. So, or from your, in verse 30, will from among your own selves or from your midst. What is Yeah, from among your own selves. Yeah. Men will arise. That could mean, that could mean that they're not there yet, these savage wolves, but they're going to become elders Mm -hmm. or overseers. It could mean that they're already there. Think about people like Judas that Judas was in the 12 Mm -hmm. from the beginning, basically. Now, was he always a wolf, you know, kind of guy? Or did it kind of slowly develop because of sin? So one of the things that this could also say is that some of y'all might be legit right now, but you might turn into Mm -hmm. wolves. Now, that's something that the Didache hits on later, sheep turning into wolves. We can think about how a wolf could turn into a sheep, but it's hard for us to wrap our minds sometimes around a sheep turning into a wolf. But that's actually... I don't actually- know. I don't think it's that hard to imagine in our current culture and like what we pro- we value. I think it's easy to see how we build people up and pride that can do all kinds of things. Sure. I mean, I agree with you. Yeah. I just, from certain doctrinal standpoints, people that, you know... Uh, once saved, always saved kind of mm-hmm. thing. If you're a sheep, then you're a sheep forever. Yeah. That's not what the earliest Christians believed. And even like a, an example would be um, Nicholas is the last of the seven deacons mentioned in Acts, Acts chapter six. And the early Christians said that Nicholas is the one who the Nicolaitans are named after in Revelation two. Mm. 
So this Nicholas became a false teacher. He became like a wolf to draw people away. Yeah. Mm. So, I mean, that's super early church history, like right. second century. So anyway, um, but these wolves, uh, they don't spare the flock. So they're exploiting the flock. They're mm-hmm. eating the flock in a sense for their own benefit or trying to kill the flock in a sense, destroy their spiritual, you know, yeah, their spiritual life maybe. Um, or to draw away disciples after them. So this could be similar to the false prophet thing in Deuteronomy 13. You remember how Jesus lumps false prophets with wolves and how the false prophets in Deuteronomy 13 say, like they show true signs in a sense, like they're deceiving signs, but they're actually happening. Uh, I, I apologize for saying true um, but these things come true. Right. They happen. Uh, and they may be very miraculous. But the idea is to draw them away from God, to serve a different God. So perhaps with some of these wolves, it's to draw people away to worship them. Mm. They become like the main focal point of people's hope and belief. Now that seems to go along with a lot of what happens in our culture today where you have that one charismatic person and these people's faith like hangs on every word they say and they're not putting the people are not putting their faith so much in what the bible says but what the leader says right and even if the bible like plainly says you know, doctrine A is right and the leader says doctrine A is wrong, like you just misunderstanding doctrine A. The people just take the leader's word for it. Right. So it makes sense? Mm-hmm. So um, I don't know. You have any thoughts on any of that? Um, well, I think that we, you know, this talking about um, instructions for overseers, but I think that we all have a responsibility to like look out for the whole flock. And mm. if we're all looking out for it, then less stuff is going to like slip through the cracks. And we have to be more involved in each other's lives in order to be able to to do this. Like if you don't know the person on the other side of the sanctuary from you, now this is assuming you're meeting in like a church building, but if you don't know them, then how can you like look out for them really? So you've got to, you know, have connections with them and you have to be um, looking out for them, but you also need to know that nobody is above like being wrong or being corrupted. That, you know, like you were saying, this this leader can get away with saying anything. You know, we have to, if we, if we hear it, you know, being untrue things, then we need to like go to that person and talk to them. Absolutely. Yeah. So. So we've talked about false teach a little bit of false teacher, a little bit of false prophet, wolf. Now, in 2 Corinthians 11, you see that uh, there also could be not just selfish motives going on, but satanic motivation going on. And so let's get into this. Steph, can you read 2 Corinthians 11? And it's going to be 3 through 4 and then 13 through 15. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. So... 
Now you have false apostles, but these apostles are apostles of Satan, it seems, Mm -hmm. because Paul says these are Satan's servants. Now he could be using that in an Ephesians 2 kind of way, where at one time we all followed the prince of the power of the air kind of thing, Mm -hmm. that they don't understand they're serving Satan, but they are. Or it could be people that are literally serving the devil and they're coming in to the church preaching a different gospel. Now, Paul hits on that at Galatians 1 as well. But, you know, these people uh, we might see in church history as being some of the Gnostics. Like... um, Jesus didn't actually come in the flesh. He just appeared to be human. So he didn't actually die on the cross. You know, this is the docetists kind of thing. He, he just seemed to be human, right. but he, so he didn't actually suffer and die. So he didn't, he won't actually, didn't actually physically rise from the dead. You know, we're not going to have a literal physical, physical resurrection either. You know, these are some of the doctrines from certain Gnostic um, preachers at that time. And so some of these people were like literally like servants of the devil, it seems. All right. So we're going to get into Revelation 2 now. We've been talking about uh, many like male uh, wolves or false prophets. Now we're going to see a female in this position. Now, this is Revelation 2, verses 20 through 22. You want to read that? But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. All right. So you have this false prophet who leads the people astray, false prophetess who leads the people to to commit idolatry. So this is like right out of Deuteronomy 13. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, this is a prophetess and who calls, she calls herself a prophetess. So notice God is not calling her a prophetess. Right. She's false. She's self-promoting in a sense, which is what we see a lot in our culture. But this is not new. This is old. So she's like, I'm a prophetess. I'm a prophetess. But she doesn't just prophesy. She also teaches. So here's some of the Venn diagram thing where you have a false teacher a false prophet to also being a false teacher. Mm -hmm. And God is not pleased. So he wants her and the people who she's teaching to repent, which would probably require the people in this church to confront her in Theatira to confront her. It's yeah. going to require that. So, yeah, I think it's, um, you know, it's interesting. It says, unless they repent of her deeds. So, their, their unrighteousness was following her, but her unrighteousness was, or her, you know, unrighteous acts were to lead them to follow idols. But, um, I think that it's interesting. You said they gave her time to repent and she does not want to repent. Um, yeah, we don't know how long that that time is. So um, yeah, I think that's, I don't know. It's just interesting. Yeah, and it could have been through uh, some of the leaders there or people there already confronting her. Yeah. We don't know how many times she's been confronted You know, our previous leader had been confronted many times before us by people we didn't know. Yeah. That that had been going on for a while. 
And uh, then we did hear him, and we've said this before, about him being confronted by people saying, you know, if you don't repent, God's going to remove your lampstand kind of thing. Yeah. And it was almost like you've been given enough time mm-hmm. and you did not repent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's hard when you're being told how great you are sometimes. I think that's yeah. that's what happens in a lot of churches. Sure. And this there. woman was a celebrity. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we're going to get into um, probably the most lengthy passage from the Bible um, about false prophets and false teachers. So I'm just going to highlight some different things along the way. And if you see something, you know, cut me off. Okay. If you see something you want to say. Okay. So so First Peter 2, 1, this is probably written, or sorry, Second Peter 2, Two one. This is probably written around sixty three A.D., maybe early sixty four. This is right before Peter is uh, going to be executed by Nero. Okay. So Peter says, false prophets, um, just as they previously arose among the people, uh, there are also going to be false prophets that arise now, and false teachers that are going to arise you know, very soon, okay? So he kind of links false prophets and false teachers, but they could also be uh, separate, Mm -hmm. okay? Then he says they secretly introduce destructive heresies. That's an interesting one. Yeah. Is it secret that it's destructive or is it that secret that it's a heresy? Like It's it's secret that probably both. Yeah, if it's a heresy, it's going to be destructive, but um, it's not on its face so easy to detect, Mm -hmm. perhaps. Maybe people aren't thinking through the implications of some of these doctrines. Yeah. Right. And maybe some of those would be things like the hyper grace stuff we've done or I've talked about a a long time ago. Yeah. But uh, it seems good on its face. But as you really think through it... um, it, it it really, it can be very destructive. Yeah, that's just redundant, but oh well. All right, so in verse two, it says, though many are going to follow their sensuality. So these false prophets' sensuality, or their lusts maybe. And because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. So one of the things you're going to get as we go along is these people like follow after their lusts and they exploit women and and causes others to do the same thing. And allegedly that went on at IHOP as well, like Bickle doing things, following sensuality, and then some of the other leaders starting to do those same things. And then lower leaders and lower leaders doing the same things. Like it kind of had this trickle down avalanche kind of effect. And because of that, the way of truth is maligned. Like people are, have left the faith that were part of IHOP, you know? Right. And not just that, but then now we're finding out more and more. Now people are looking down on Christianity as a whole. You know, some people are. So it's very uh, destructive, not just to the people involved, but to those who eventually hear about it. Yeah. I mean, it's one thing for Bickle or whoever to like destroy their own reputation, but it's just obviously like the main thing is we're destroying the reputation of Christ and of the body of Christ. And so, you know, that's being brought down in the process. Yeah. Now, one of the things that these false prophets or wolves will do will use that reasoning that we've both been just now talking about to justify covering up their abuses. Because mm, they don't want Jesus to look bad. Right. Yeah. So it's better that we don't talk about it. Now, the pushback to that is, you know, we, we have to mm-hmm. because it's just going to get worse and yeah. worse and worse. More people are going to get hurt if we allow this to continue. Yeah. If we don't bring it to light, you got to bring stuff into the light, you know? So uh, how do you, how do you feel about like our current day and age where like information can be disseminated so quickly? Like the, the secrets get out so much quicker. And I mean, do you feel like that's a good thing or is that a 
bad thing or, or is that neutral? I don't know. I think it's a biblical thing. Uh, in Daniel, I think it's Daniel 12, it talks about how in the, these last days, knowledge is going to increase. Mm. And you've definitely seen that, you know, starting, I, I would imagine, like in the early 1900s, you just see this radical increase in technology and all this stuff. And the world kind of in one sense becomes a lot smaller, even though there's so many yeah. more people in the world. We can connect with people all across the world that we mm-hmm. don't know and almost seem like we're friends, but we've never actually met, you know, right. this, this kind of a thing. And um, so... It's harder to hide secrets for sure. They're, they're I mean, <laughs> yeah. y- you can't, yeah, I don't know. I just feel like it's people always think that they're going to be able to keep their secrets under wraps and it just doesn't work out for very long. Yeah. Yeah, it's um it definitely seems like there's some sort of reckoning happening yeah. happening now. Mm-hmm. Anyway, let's get back to this. So, um still in 2 Peter 2 in verse 10, it says they indulge the flesh. So these are like these false prophets again, like this is part of the fruit that you're talking about. What's the negative fruit, the bad fruit? They indulge the flesh. They uh, follow their sensuality. They introduce destructive heresies secretly. So they're being clever. Mm-hmm. Um, it says they despise authority. So one of the things that we've seen allegedly with like Mike Bickle is when people who he wanted to like hold, originally like wanted to hold him accountable, tried to hold him accountable. He rejected that accountability. Mm-hmm. He rejected that authority. Yeah. Um, it says they're daring. So they're like risk takers in a sense and not in a good way. Mm-hmm. They're self-willed. They're self-governed. They're not governed by God's will as much as they're governed by their own. Um, it says that in verse 13, they revel in their deceptions which is interesting. So that's like real evil stuff. They're deceiving and they're proud of it, like you said. Now, Paul talks about how evildoers will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. He talks about that in his letter to Timothy, one of the letters to Timothy. And that's interesting too, like the the person, and I think... um, Blaze and Christina Foray have talked about this, like how the biggest deception with Mike Bickle, he's been deceiving people, but the person he's deceived the most is himself. Yeah. I mean, like (laughs) Ravi Zacharias, like that whole, the investigation and to all of his, you know, immorality and whatever. But he, I think he, called the woman that he was having an affair with his reward. Like he really believed that this was God's gift for him being such a good minister, which is like, how, I don't know how you even, like it's so mind boggling that you can justify it in that way, but we've seen it. So it, and we've seen it from people that know the Bible, yeah. like, so it it is possible and we all need to be cautious and careful. Most definitely. So we're all capable of that stuff. Right. And deceitfulness of sin, it hardens our hearts, you know, as yeah. Hebrews 3 talks about. But mm-hmm. your um, point there about Ravi and this woman he viewed as like his prize. Yeah. yeah. Verse 14, they have eyes full of adultery. So this is going to be a common theme among false teachers, false prophets, is that they're going to be adulterous. Mm-hmm. Um, they entice unstable souls. So they go after people who are either like financially desperate or they're in kind of a crisis area or they um, they don't have a good foundation maybe of familiar familial support yeah. uh or they don't have a good foundation of biblical you know knowledge yeah and so they're easily manipulated they go they look for people who they can manipulate easily mm-hmm. 
And uh, it says their hearts are trained in greed. Hearts trained in greed. So they've been teaching themselves. They've been training themselves when their fleshly desire like pulls them toward wanting more, they go for it. And that kind of goes with this self-willed thing. They're not being governed by the spirit. They're being governed by their heart. They follow their heart. And so their heart is training, making them their greedy side stronger. Mm -hmm. And like perhaps more um, uh, knowledgeable in how to feed that need for greed. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Sorry. You did that. Right. But do you understand (laughs) what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, no, it it gets easy. Like sin gets so much easier the more you do it. Yeah. So like you know you figure out you learn from your mistakes. They become smarter. Yeah. In how to. Oh yeah. Feed this, how to get away with it, mm-hmm. how to convince people that greed is actually being generous. You know. Yeah. yeah. How to convince themselves of that? Right. Right. Uh, they go the way to Balaam, the way of Balaam loving the wages of run unrighteousness. So that's more, gosh, there's so much there. Um, but they speak arrogant words of vanity. Um, wow. I think we saw a lot of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but 19 is they promise freedom to people while they themsel- themselves are slaves of corruption. So again, this is like part of the fruit aspect. You see that they're like slaves to this stuff. So when people are trying to bring them out, it's almost like they, they're they stuck in a sense. Now they're not really stuck, but maybe they feel that way. You know, maybe that's one of the reasons why we see some of these people dig in their heels so, so feverishly or whatever, fervently, while uh, when people are trying to confront them because it's almost become like who they are. It's become like their identity and um, or maybe they think there's too much to lose if they were to come out. And so they just become slaves to this Mm. corrupting lifestyle. I don't know. Yeah. Like allegedly Bickle is like doubling down on this and he started a new website called like 12 judges and a lot of folks in the IHOP community or the ex-IHOP community are like this is Mike Bickle and like he's speaking whoever is on this is like speaking about Mike Bickle he writes in the same like style as Mm -hmm. Mike Bickle he talks about how he doesn't know Mike Bickle but then he goes into all of these like intimate details about Mike Bickle and all of the allegations against Mike Bickle. It's like a little kid. <laughs> it's right. Yeah. It's like so to us, yeah. it seems so obvious, like, bro, everybody can see this. Mm-hmm. And he's just like deceived. He's a deceiver that has become deceived. That he thinks he can like bring himself out of this through more evil and more deception. Yeah. It's like he's enslaved to it. Mm-hmm. It's it's sad. Like this yeah. is becoming, he's creating this horrific legacy for himself. It's wild. All right. So let's go ahead and transition now to some early Christian stuff. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but uh, we'll spend some time. The Didache in chapter 11 speaks specifically about uh, false prophets and how to determine if someone is a false prophet, which is interesting. So you got these like traveling teachers and traveling uh, uh, like prophets in this time. Now, this is probably like late first century, perhaps. And so you have people like Paul uh, going from place to place, Barnabas, right? Silas, you have people like going throughout the world, um, starting uh, churches and then people going around strengthening churches. Uh, you see different prophets coming together in Antioch in Acts 12, I believe. Um, 
So these are like some of the offices, you could say, in the church. Now, one of the things that the Didache says in chapter 11 is that if you have this prophet come to you, or this supposed prophet come to you, and he's like, give me money and I'll prophesy. Sounds a bit like a fortune teller. Yeah, then he's, <laughs> he is a false prophet. Yeah. Now, here's an interesting thing. Then it says, and every prophet who teaches the truth but does not do what he teaches is a false prophet. Mm. So that could also go with like false teacher kind of thing. Gosh, so, I feel like that could be any of us. Yeah. Like if we've ever taught a lesson on something and we don't do it, it's a harsh word. It's a harsh word. Now, hopefully part of this is also like repenting and like accepting accountability right. and that kind of stuff when we struggle, right? But um, interesting. But whoever says in the spirit, give me money. They're saying it in the spirit. God says that you are told to give me money mm -hmm. um, or something else. You shall not listen to him. But if he tells you to give for others' sake who are in need, let no one judge him. So if the guy is saying, look, we need to raise up an offering for these orphans, right? Mm -hmm. Or widows, like that's, that's awesome. Like we've been at some concerts where the musician basically stops the concert in the mid middle or the band stops the concert right. in the middle and like says, look guys, like we appreciate y'all coming to see us, but there's a bigger cause. We're trying to raise money for people in the foster system or something like that, for mm -hmm. kids in the foster system, different things like that. Uh, that's pretty cool. Um, of course, if people want to just want to bless folks, you know, you see that in the New Testament, but Paul doesn't go around saying, give me money. Sometimes people will support him mm -hmm. and they will support Jesus, but Jesus wasn't going around saying, give me money and I'll teach you, mm -hmm. you know. So, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, later, Didache, chapter 16, talks about that. Um, in the last days, these sheep are going to become wolves. So, that's interesting. Wrote a little bit about that in my last book. Um, but, um, yeah, gosh, that's so crazy how, like, someone could turn into a wolf over time. Not just turn into an unbeliever, but turn into a wolf. Yeah. And I think we've maybe seen that sometimes. Mm. No, I agree. And it's it's so sad, but I mean, it's important to make sure that you have people that hold you accountable and that you, you know, are receiving that accountability. And hopefully those people that, you know, quote unquote, hold you accountable are not afraid to confront. Yeah. So. Absolutely. Now, uh, Justin, uh, Justin Martyr, guy we talked about last episode, he uh, has this incredible work called Dialogue with his Dialogue with Trifo. So this is a Jewish guy, and Justin and him are having a conversation. And Trifo is kind of doing polemics. Mm -hmm. He's trying to tear down Christianity because he's a Jew, doesn't believe in Jesus. And Justin is doing apologetics. He's trying to defend the faith. Mm -hmm. So it's a really cool uh, example of how to speak to Jewish people, how early Christians would to show Jewish people that their Messiah has come. So... So Trifo, this is in chapter 35, he says, I believe, however, that many of those who say that they confess Jesus and are called Christians, they eat meat offered to idols. And uh, just, and Trifo's like, what's up? What's up with that? You know, why are these Christians who can, you know, these people who are calling themselves Christians committing idolatry? Justin's response is interesting. He's like, yeah, the fact that there are such men who confess themselves to be Christians and admitted the crucified Jesus to both be the Lord and Christ, yet not teaching his doctrines, um, but those of the spirits 
of error causes us to be causes us who are disciples of the true and pure doctrine of Jesus Christ to be more faithful and steadfast in the hope announced by him for what things he predicted would take place in his name these things we see being accomplished in our sight for he said many will come in my name clothed outwardly in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravening or ravening wolves so justin is saying like to a person who, and we could think about it also for people in our day that have been hurt by the church and they're like, how can Christianity be true if you have these teachers who are leading people astray, not just in their words, but in their actions? And Justin's response can be like ours. Well, Jesus said that was going to happen. Mm-hmm. So it actually proves Jesus to be true. Right. He prophesied this stuff. Yeah. Paul prophesied this stuff. Like we were told this is coming. Mm-hmm. It's always something good to keep in mind. Yeah. And it just reminds us what we put our hope in. Yeah. But some people were going to be really, really disappointed. Yeah. Now, uh, later in that, in chapter 82, one of the things that Justin says is a good reminder for us. He says, the prophetic... The prophetical gifts remain with us even to this present time. And um, there's more to that quote. I'd encourage people to read in chapter 82. But, you know, there's some people that say that the, like, the spiritual gift of prophecy died with the apostles. Mm-hmm. Well, Justin's writing this around 160. Irenaeus talks about the same kind of thing in around 180. Like, the prophetic gifts are real. Mm -hmm. And so wherever you see like real prophetic gifts, Satan is going, or not prophetic gifts, spiritual gifts, Satan will try to counterfeit. Right. So like there's a spiritual calling of apostle. So you have false apostles, Mm -hmm. servants of Satan, spiritual gift of teaching. There are false teachings. There's spiritual gift of the effecting of miracles. Well, Satan will have false ones. And it doesn't necessarily mean they're magic tricks. It just means ne- perhaps they're demonically inspired. And we're going to get into that in a second. Mm. Um, let's go to Irenaeus. Let's just go to Marcus. So this is a uh, really, really wild. So in the second century, you had this dude named Marcus who came in among the church and began to deceive the people. Yeah. All right. So this is a little bit lengthy, but I'm going to read a little bit. If you want me to stop, stop me. Okay. All right. This is wild. Okay. So Irenaeus writes, but there's another among the heretics. He's been going through different ones. Mm -hmm. He says, this guy's Marcus. He boasts of himself as having improved upon his master. He is a perfect, yeah. No, he's boastful, right? I mean, arrogant, that's second Peter. He's a perfect adept in magical impostures and by this means drawing away a great number of men. So you have him being a magician. Yeah. Okay. So... By this means, he has drawn away a great number of men. Remember Paul saying wolves are going to draw away disciples after themselves? Yeah. That's what he's doing. And not a few women, so a ton of women as well. For he has induced them to join themselves to him. So not join themselves to Jesus, but to him. As to one who is possessed of the greatest knowledge and perfection and who has received the highest power from the invisible and effable regions above from heaven, right? He doesn't have any problem tooting his own horn, does he? He doesn't. I mean, <laughs> it's it's pretty strong. It, it may not be uh, quite as strong as Manny, from the uh, who dis- who'd come the Manichaeans who called himself the Paraclete, yeah, from like John fourteen, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's it's not quite this strong necessarily, 
but it's pretty strong. Yeah. Right. And so Irenaeus continues, it says, thus it appears as if he really were the precursor of the Antichrist, which is really interesting. I mean, the Antichrist is the false Christ. We've been talking about false apostles, false prophets, false teachers. There's going to be a false Christ. Right. Who is also a false teacher. He has a false prophet. He sends out, it seems, false apostles. Anyway, continuing. It appears probable enough that this man possesses a demon as his familiar spirit. So this guy is demonized by means of whom he seems able to prophesy and also enables as many as he counts worthy to be partakers of his charis, his grace, themselves to prophesy. So Irenaeus is saying this guy is demonized. And so the reason why he is like, he's so popular is probably because his quote unquote prophecies are coming true. Mm. He's doing signs and wonders. He can teach people how to prophesy by a spirit. Now, remember Paul in uh, second Corinthians was saying, if someone's preaching to you a different gospel or you receive a different spirit, here is people receiving a different spirit mm. in the church, not the Holy Spirit, a different spirit that's causing them to quote unquote prophesy as well. And it's not parlor tricks. This is like actual stuff that's happening. It's not from God, but it's right. actually happening. All right. That's why he's so popular. So he devotes himself Marcus does, especially to women and those such as are well-bred. Yeah. <laughs> so he, he really goes after the good-looking women and women of good stature, like they come, they have, you know, good bloodlines maybe, you know, right. like they, they're part of a prominent family because it says, and they're elegantly attired and of great wealth whom he frequently seeks to draw after him by addressing them in such seductive words. Marcus, goodness. He's going at, well, Mike. Yeah. Bickle, you know, like they're going, Ravi, they're going after these women trying to seduce, he particularly like the good looking ones and the wealthy ones. Right. Now it's, you know, you contrast this to Jesus Women were flocking to him as well, but he was not trying to seduce them. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he was on mission for God. He wasn't, women were trying to give him money and they did help support him, but he wasn't exploiting them. Right. He wasn't asking them for money. He wasn't trying to get them to do, you know, illicit things, you mm -hmm. know, immoral things with him. You know, and he had the real power. He is the main one from heaven, you know, God. So he could have used his power and ability to exploit, but he didn't. Right. These guys do. So let's keep going. This is the last paragraph. We're skipping forward a little bit. On the woman replying, so a woman would come to him and say, I have never at any time prophesied, nor do I know how to prophesy. So this is an example. Mm -hmm. And then engaging for the second time in certain invocations so as to astound his deluded victim, he says to her, open your mouth, speak whatever occurs to you, and you shall prophesy. So this is interesting He's trying, he's teaching them how to do it, but he's doing this with like a d demon. Mm. So she then vainly puffed up and elated by these words and greatly excited in soul by the expectation that it is herself who is to prophesy. Her heart violently beating from emotion, she reaches the requisite pitch of audacity and idly as well as impudently utters some nonsense <laughs> as it happens to occur to her, such as, 
might be expected from one healed or heated by an empty spirit. So what could be happening here? What's happening in her? Perhaps she is now being demonized Mm -hmm. or perhaps it's like some of the, you know. Like manifesting what she's like trying. I don't know, maybe that's not the right word, but she's trying to speak it into existence. She's making it happen. Maybe that's like when people are quote unquote taught how to speak in tongues. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just open your mouth and start saying whatever comes to your mind and it's not actually the Holy Spirit or a bad spirit, an evil spirit. It's just their imagination (laughs) and they're just kind of like you were saying, just kind of making it come out of their mouth Mm -hmm. and they think it's real and maybe the people around them think it's real too. And they're like, oh my gosh, she got filled, you know, but it's not. Or it could be, like we said, demonic kind of a thing. Yeah. Because this is not the legitimate, true version of prophesying. It's like people do speak in tongues, uh, but there's the counterfeit as well. So how does she respond? Well, henceforth, she reckons herself as a prophetess and expresses her thanks to Marcus. Notice, she's not thanking God because Marcus isn't trying to get people to be devoted to God. He's trying to get people to be devoted to him. Mm -hmm. But he's using this religious language, the charis, the grace, prophesy. He's a wolf in sheep's clothing, but he's getting the sheep to turn away from the shepherd and to follow him. Then Irenaeus says, then she makes the effort to reward him. Mm. Gross. Not only by the gift of her possessions, in which way he has collected a large fortune, but also by yielding up to him her person, desiring in every way to be united to him so that she may become altogether one with him. Sounding a bit David Koreshi. It's sounding a bit bickly. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds weird. I mean, like she wants to be one with this man of quote unquote God. Yeah. I want to be as close to this guy as I possibly can. Yeah. And then that he's just eating it up. He's just <sighs> exploiting these people. Eyes full of adultery. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, like, how should we respond to this? You know, um, what are what are some of your thoughts on like how to respond to to these kind of people? Call it out. It's got. I mean, like, you know, I I know that God brings conviction, but it sounds like a lot of these people are not listening so they may need to hear they probably need to hear it vocally from the mouth of a person that they know cares about them and you know we want to save their souls i think it's it's these are not bad people in the sense that they are like beyond redemption like god can still redeem them god still loves them And, you know, we should want their repentance for a multitude of reasons. One, they would no longer be a predator, you know, going after the flock, but also because like we care about them as a brother or sister, you know, we care about them and we want them to be right with God. They're going to face judgment. We don't want them to burn in hell for all of eternity. You know, we want them to experience forgiveness. And um, I'm not saying that they can't have, they shouldn't have consequences, but, you know, we should want them to come to repentance. Yeah. 
Now, repentance doesn't necessarily mean restoration back into the same position. No. Kind of like if you have a bartender, a, a person who works at a bar, and they're a bartender, and uh, we'll just say this is Joe, yeah. and uh, Joe becomes a raging alcoholic. Yeah. And uh, he's having horrible you know, issues with his family, and he's showing up to work drunk. So he's, he's not only like, you know, drunk at home, he's drunk at the bar and he's drinking the drinks from the bar. Yeah. You know, he's, Mm -hmm. yeah, like the manager of the bar wants Joe to get well. Mm -hmm. So he fires Joe and tells him to go to, you know, a a program. Mm Mm-hmm. So Joe does praise the Lord. He really he really gets right, you know, with his family mm-hmm. and all of that. Now Joe's been out of work for a while, and he's been clean. Mm-hmm. Should Joe then go back to being a bartender? No, the temptation's too much there. Yeah, and I think that. Yeah, I think it's important that we realize that. I don't know. I think I, you and I were talking about this with some friends, but like it's it's perfectly okay for individuals who, you know, maybe were not good in a church setting to just get a regular job. You know, they can work um what like the jobs of anybody else, a lay person, but they do not need to be in those positions. Like that is probably not the best thing for them. And, you know, it's going to require some humility um, on their part, but we don't need to, and I I think there's there's a lot of push in our culture, our evangelical culture to like restore them to this position. You know, we give them a little leave of absence and then we want to restore them to these positions. And some people need to be out. Like, not that they are beyond forgiveness, but this situation or this type of work is not safe for them or for their the people in their church. Yeah. We don't want somebody who has a youth pastor who has had a relationship with one of his youth to repent, to get counseling and to go back into youth ministry. Yeah. It would be a terrible idea, um, but unfortunately it happens. Yeah. Now it's like with youth ministry, like if someone's preying on youth, you know, that needs to be reported to the police. Right. Um, That doesn't need, the church doesn't need to investigate that kind of a thing. Yeah. Like you need the authorities to investigate that, Mm -hmm. that kind of a thing. Uh, Or a pastor being accused of rape. Like you don't need to do Matthew 18 with the woman who's been raped you know, confronting her rapist one-on-one, you know, and saying, you need to repent. Like that's, that's not what this is about, you know, Um, that should be handled by the authorities. But with things that are not necessarily like illegal, but are definitely immoral, Mm -hmm. uh, if they're in ministry, we definitely need to confront them, call them out. Now, probably that needs to be handled first, you know, one-on-one, hopefully. Yeah. This is this is wrong, brother, sister, whatever it is. Like, don't you see how this is wrong? Explaining to them from scripture, giving them an opportunity to repent. Like yeah. God does with the Jezebel lady, you know? Um, but if they continue sinning, and this is a, a leader, mm-hmm. you know, if they continue in it, 1 Timothy 5 says to rebuke them publicly to call them out publicly. Now you have other texts like in first Corinthians five, where you have this man in the congregation who is uh, having relations with his stepmother and the church is proud about it. And Paul's like, you need to have nothing to do with that man. You need to kick him out of the church, remove the that man from your midst. Mm -hmm. He's like a little leaven screws up the, or it goes throughout the whole, you know, uh, batch of dough. So remove that man, deliver him to Satan. Like it's basically shun 
shun the dude. So yeah. this would be someone who's been confronted a few times. The church has been made aware of it and like you need to shun him. That's that's rough, but I mean, that's what it is. Um, that same passage that you're referencing in 1 Corinthians 5, um, I think it's important that they distinguish that this is somebody who's calling themselves a Christian versus like this is just somebody who's visiting church for the first time or something like that. Like this is not judging the unbeliever. That's for, you know, for God to do. But basically like, I don't know. I, I think a lot of times Christians get get called things like they're ch- they're judgmental. We should be accepting. We should do whatever. But then we also get, and you know, churches get called out because there's rampant inappropriate things happening in some churches. And so I think we need to make sure that we are known for looking out for the flock and looking out for those who um, God has entrust, entrusted to us and who has you know, put in our congregation or put in our, our body of believers. We need to be looking out for them. So we're, it may come across as being judgmental, but it's not, the hope is for them to repent. The hope is not that they stay and they never return. They're never welcome back again. It's that we have, you know, we have to look out for them. We have to look out for each other. Yeah. And, you know, we have to honor the name of Christ. Now, with that, we'll do one final verse passage, okay? okay? And as we're trying to look out for them and honor Christ, we need to keep Revelation 2, 1 through 2 in mind. So this is to the church at Ephesus. And Jesus says, hey, I know your deeds, which are good in a sense. You got good deeds. Mm -hmm. I know your perseverance and that you don't put up with evil men. You don't tolerate them. You don't put up with these guys. You put those to the test who call themselves apostles and they are not, and you found them to be false. So that this is this is a church who like these overseers and the people in this church they don't put up with that nonsense. This is good, mm-hmm. right? So they're calling that stuff out because they're trying to protect the flock. That's really good. But what does Jesus say after that? But this I have against you that you have forsaken the love you had at first. So this is like. I'm not sure exactly how to say this, but as we're, what I found in myself is that the, the more I, I focus on calling this stuff out, um, it makes me angry Yeah, <laughs> and it can make me sad and it can make me, um, I don't know, just not as joyful and so ministry can turn into like finding the counterfeits mm-hmm. instead of loving the true. Yeah. You know, and exposing the counterfeits, identifying the counterfeits. Um, if, if that is our main focus though, like it's going to kind of harden us if our eyes are primarily fixed on the counterfeit yeah. instead of the true. So it's, this is not to say we shouldn't like try to expose the unfruitful works of darkness. You know, we sh- of course we're supposed to do that. That's what we're told in scripture, but we got to make sure that we're also taking time to really nurture our love for Jesus. Steph, you got any closing thoughts? No, I think that what you said is really good. I think that um, we don't want to get bogged down in the darkness that might, might be there, but we want to focus on the light of Jesus. Heart,
as the watchmen's cry Wake, brethren, wake Jesus our Lord is nigh Wake, brethren, wake Sleep is for sons of night You are the sons of light Yours is the glory bright Wake, brethren, wake Watch me sing.